Uh, chairman, uh, director, fellow politicians, historians, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, politicians are reputed often unfairly to have only short-term horizons where what looms largest is the next election. Historians have perspectives that stretch back over generations, if not centuries, so I might be forgiven for feeling a little schizophrenic this evening. Historical perspective helps to put in context current difficulties and counteracts the natural but subjective tendency of people to regard the present and near future as the most critically important period in our history just because it is so for us. The McGill Summer School, which is an enormous credit to its organizers and to its director, Joe Mulholland, has been engaged all this week in national stock taking. The title of this session implicitly points to the looming centenary of the 1916 Rising and Proclamation, something that preoccupies the OPW and other departments I work with. The title uh, perhaps begs a few questions, such as when the Republic or the Free State that became the Republic was founded, 1916, 1919, 1922, 1937 to 8, or 1949, though most of us opt for 1916. Aside from that, consideration should also be given to the large contribution of antecedents, both constitutional and revolutionary, such as the United Irishman, O'Connell, Young Ireland, the Fenians, and Parnell, whose portrait dominates the council chamber and government buildings, not forgetting John Redmond. In Donegal, would we not have to go back to the flight of the earls and what Pierce called the historic Irish nation, especially as the first recorded mention of a republic, albeit under Spanish protection, was in 1627 in a petition from Owen Roe O'Neill to King Philip IV looking for his support. And this discovery was highlighted by the late Cardinal O'Fee, delighted to prove that Oliver Cromwell, who incorporated this island into both a republic and a union, was not the fons et origo of the republican tradition in Ireland. Looking to the future, is there a potential place to be reserved in a republic should circumstances change for a community on the island that at present and for a long time past has resolutely preferred to stay British? Then, to what extent do the ideals and ambitions of the founders limited as they were and we are in time and space adequately encompass those many ideals and ambitions we have developed in the 90 years since in contexts that could not all have been anticipated. Separation was the defining goal of the 1916 Rising, passing out the demand for limited internal self-government characteristic of Home Rule, Repeal and Grattan's Parliament. The two external models in 1916, as in 1848 and 1798, were the United States and France. Even if our subsequent parliamentary institutions and procedures, including PRSTV, public administration, and once Gladstonian public finance, owe more to Britain. Ireland's independence, restricted at first, was consolidated and extended in a hostile external environment in the 1930s and 1940s, but acquired a new lease of life in the lead up to EEC accession and since. Maintaining our economic independence within a framework of interdependence has quite often been acutely challenging, especially in the last couple of years where we have been faced with an existential financial and banking crisis which suddenly blew up. I heard last week a European finance minister say that the essence of a crisis is that it is unexpected. Christine Lagarde, appointed French economics minister in 2007, has said she had no idea what lay ahead. EU President Van Rompuy has described the first decade of EMU when it was a strong currency as some kind of sleeping pill. We weren't aware of the underlying problems. A member of NESC has used the same analogy to explain a collective lack of foresight here. The way in which we have been particularly hard hit shows that freedom once achieved can never be taken for granted. Some countries indeed have temporarily forfeited much of their economic sovereignty. Each generation has to protect, sustain, and extend what has been won. And notwithstanding current pressures, Ireland today has a level of international respect and recognition that did not exist even a generation ago. And in that regard, more than fulfills the ideals and ambitions of its founders. 
We have taken our place among the nations, even if, for lack of island-wide completeness, we may remain reluctant to write Robert Emmett's epitaph. Roger Casement and Tom Kettle, from different perspectives, believed Ireland must become more European. For Casement, because Ireland was necessary and essential to Europe, and for Kettle, because to become deeply Irish, Ireland must become European. We have anchored our identity in a European context as partners with countries that long fought each other in dialectical terms a synthesis. Ireland's EU membership, 37 years on, has been a fulfilment of the ideals and ambitions not so much of our founders as of the post-war generation. And for those of us who have been in different branches of public service since the 1970s, our entire careers have been framed by the EU. There have been some strains in that relationship over the past 10 years. The initial rejection of the Nice and Lisbon treaties reflected both a popular disconnect and a touch of hubris also fueled by Eurosceptic influences. It also reflected an ingrained cultural habit, evident in any cattle mart, of rejecting first bids in the hope of an improved offer before putting ourselves on the market and taking what is available. But at the back of it all is a genuine and legitimate concern about striking the right balance between sovereign independence, including control of domestic decision-making and resource allocation, and shared sovereignty. Since the second Lisbon referendum, the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone has renewed the question in the minds of some economic commentators as to whether we should remain members or whether we should be in some outer zone with Britain, allowing us freedom to devalue and apply Keynesian remedies. Neither government nor opposition are entertaining that option, nor did the Regling and Watson report on the banking crisis. Our commitment to the Euro is a strong cross-party political one as well as an economic one. With the possible exception of the Belfast United Irishmen in their early constitutional phase, the Irish nationalist tradition, not for want of trying, lacked an adequate concept for dealing with what became an entrenched unionist tradition other than as a national minority. Home rule might have been an historic compromise between unionism and nationalism but its rejection was allowed to stand in 1912-14, which greatly reduced the point of the compromise. James Connolly wanted to avoid conflict with the North in 1916 and deal with unionism only when the Republic's authority had been established over the rest of the country. The Easter Rising, the setting up of Doyle Aaron, the Government of Ireland Act 1920 and the Treaty – and here may I recommend the Lavery exhibition showing many of the protagonists in the Dublin City Gallery, the Hugh Lane, all pointed to a decision to go separate ways. It has taken two generations and years of tragic conflict to re-establish connections on the island, which in real terms has brought us further forward than in any previous time. And virtually all the pieces envisaged in the agreement, north-south bodies, a new beginning in policing, devolution of policing, decommissioning, and many other things are now in place. Uh, and, of course, um, the parties supporting the arrangements now include uh, the DUP. With regard to recognition of the orange tradition, the people of this state have made an appropriate contribution by reinstating the Battle of the Boyne site at Oldbridge. Indeed, I accompanied Dr. Paisley and his wife there uh, on their most recent visit. I would regard some of the further suggestions made here earlier this week as premature, if not a little patronizing. Few Protestants far this side of the border feel an affinity with the Orange Order, and even its influence and following in Northern Ireland is far from what it was. And when we talk about transforming attitudes, it needs to happen on all sides. Our neighboring head of state, Queen Elizabeth, in a reign of 58 years, has come to the island of Ireland many times across the border. Few ever objected to British prime ministers who exercise all political power coming to this jurisdiction to meet Taoiseach or attend EU summits here. The substance of our relationships on these islands 
including allowing for how they might evolve in the future, has been settled. And given the conspicuous failure of sore thumb politics in the past, it is hard to know what purpose or interest would be served by seeking to delay any further formal recognition of not just normal but close relationships, including rivalry, between these islands. Charles Hohey, no Anglophile, once confided to me that the British would be mad to give up royalty as they were a great tourist asset. <laughs> as we know from visits here by Kennedy, Clinton and de Gaulle soon after his resignation, high-profile state visits can be a tonic for our tourism and properly handled our national self-respect. The ideal held out of an independent or self-governing state in 1916 was that it would cherish all the children of the nation equally. And Diarmuid Ferreter has discussed other dimensions of this. The independent struggle created winners and losers both sides of the border. The Catholic Church largely captured this state from its initial weakened civil war-riven condition, symbolized in Lavery's 1922 picture, Blessing the Colors, and exercised an often determining influence in the policy areas that mattered to it. In return, it provided the state with a strong element of cohesion and political legitimacy, with lay organizations often applying added coercive pressures. I still remember a long-serving former minister advising me in the 1980s that there were two groups one should never criticize, the Catholic Church and the Gardaí. And while these conditions are long gone, absolute power allowed absolute abuses to take place in secrecy that have left a difficult and painful legacy. Religion remains a powerful element in many people's lives and is mostly a force for good, and religious leadership is still vital. The churches should not be pushed to the margins, but accepted as important contributors to the well-being of society. Many of the tensions in church-state relations come from a failure to recognize that their roles and responsibilities are distinct, but also that religion, particularly where it is slow to adapt to social change, possesses no monopoly in shaping public morality. The Constitution, as subsequently amended, provides an important benchmark of rights that have evolved with time. It allows sensitive and fundamental legislative issues touching on morality to be decided directly by the people. No one criticizes the American Constitution for belonging to the age of the Enlightenment in the 1780s, so why should we object to a Constitution on the grounds that it was formulated in the 1930s when it helped make Ireland a model of stable democracy, certainly among the states that achieved their independence post-1918? And while it has always been fashionable to espouse or pay lip service to a radical republicanism on all sides of the spectrum, from Michael McDool to Padder O'Donnell and no doubt Patrick McGill, a conservative republicanism tacitly admired by Thomas Davis and openly espoused by Eamon de Valera remains the actual underlying philosophy of the state. It is worrying when people advocate as an economy measure abolishing two out of the three components of the Oireachtas and greatly diminishing the size of the third. Radio and television shows and newspapers may enliven our democracy. They are not a substitute for the work of its institutions, the detail of which, though important, might bore the general public and the type of evening paper columnist for whom tonight's discussion is much too heavy. <laughs> Uh, at the turning point of the last recovery in 1987, it was all the fashion to suggest that we needed bankers in government. Uh, no one is proposing that today. What is always needed in government is not good businessmen, economists, or farm leaders, or from any other profession, but good politicians. And the job is not just to identify the right or even more the necessary decisions, but to be able to persuade people that they are the right and necessary decisions. 
Competition is healthy, and the main job of opposition is to challenge and put forward alternative points of view, even when they would not actually implement them if they were in government. A convincing case has yet to be made that substantial institutional or electoral changes are the answer to our problems, or that they can muster sufficient political or electoral support. I tend to agree with Cambridge professor Eugenio Biagini, whom I met last Wednesday, writing in the Irish Times of the 29th of June from a comparative perspective that constitutional change, quote, will have no bearing on the Republic's ability to avoid future financial crises or total slumps. What we do need are more politicians prepared to stand their ground against lobby groups making unreasonable demands. It was not easy to say no during the Celtic Tiger era when the constant refrain was that we were the second richest country in the EU, though in fact we were only nominally so, and that the country was awash with money. I studied Marx and Engels in a four-volume German study edition when I was in Vienna at the age of 18 and 19. And one of their legacies was to debunk the historians whose narratives focus largely on the actions of great men. The notion, therefore, that one man brought this country to its present state may be political gold, but is certainly intellectual rubbish. There is also some contradiction in claims that recent governments fell prey to an uncaring neoliberalism that shriveled the role of the state, but nonetheless can now be blamed for everything as if we lived in a totalitarian one. Societies are organisms with collective virtues and failings with many of the players outside the public sphere. One of the advantages of even recent history is to go back and look at perspectives free of today's hindsight, even a few months before disaster struck. And indeed, the committee has been uh, uh, doing that in uh, some of the co committees of investigation in recent times. Last weekend, I came across an Irish Times article of the 14th of May 2008 by Bill Nolan, involved for 40 years in property asset management. For most of his professional life, getting projects off the ground was slow and painstaking and required cash. Then, and I quote, for the past six or seven years, all that was needed was the phone number of a conventional banker and hey presto, you were a developer. Developments have had very little grounding in detailed analyses, market research, or provable numbers. And why should they? Our professional analyses were always too conservative, with prices rising 20% per annum, and on and on. And finally, the credit crunch made it obvious that we had too many developers with too many schemes for the size of the country. And while demonstrating a capacity to build 100,000 homes a year and the commercial and industrial equivalent, we don't or never will need this amount of new built space in any one year ever again. What a pity we could not all keep our pendulum in the middle instead of swinging wildly. While he does not mention government, its important part in a collective failure by virtually all the main movers in society has been repeatedly acknowledged. And I would certainly be ashamed that more of us did not clearly see the dangers coming. A lot of heavy lifting is required to extract us from the resulting mess, with government right back centre stage. We have a long haul to put our public finances and banking system back on track. Any deviation will be punished by markets and intense pressures from Europe's own partners. The next government will face no easier a task. Our competitiveness has already improved, and this will be a source of jobs and investment. And to look on the positive side, while we have stumbled badly through overconfidence, we have the ability to pick ourselves up if we can avoid further self-inflicted damage. And we have much going for us. We have approved what we can do, but next time we must do it right. To conclude... If overconfidence is a fault in business and economic management, it is equally so in politics. There are a lot of electoral chickens being counted before they are hatched. It is not the first time that Fianna Fáil has been written off, obviously a triumph of hope over experience. That Fianna Fáil has maintained its position 
as the state's largest party in the Doyle for almost 80 years is what is astonishing, not the possibility of a break in that record. As a quarter century in government with one interval in the middle nears completion, it is the whole picture, the huge progress marred by the present difficulties on which judgment should be passed. It remains to be seen what real policy alternatives will be put forward or whether antipathy to my party will provide a sufficient platform to drown out the questioners. Despite the catchphrases about bankers and developers, Fianna Fáil's best partner since 1987 has actually been the labor movement with whom social partnership was constructed. Along with the peace process, that was our greatest achievement, followed by the vast improvements in our primary transport infrastructure. We cannot say, after us, the deluge, as the deluge has already happened. <laughs> Crisis management has come at a heavy price, and I'm certainly not going to second guess what was described this week as horrendous decisions. But so far, the Taoiseach Brian Cowan and the Minister for Finance Brian Lenehan have steered the ship of state through much stormy weather with resolution and skill. Thank you.